Today we're going to go through uh, more a hands-on approach to how I approach a mix. Uh, a lot of the questions that I've been asked since uh, I've given these uh, little talks has been, you know, will you talk about bringing out the emotion in the music? Well, how do you go about doing that? What's that all about? So let's start with number one, most important, without any question, is finding yourself a good cigar. <laughs> you gotta, you can't mix without a good cigar. Now, now here in this room, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to smoke this good cigar, so I don't know how good my mix is gonna sound today. But uh, if you come to my room where I smoke my cigar, I promise you it will sound wonderful. But all, all kidding aside, um, the main point that I wanted to get through to everyone over the last few days before I get started on this is very simply one thing. Do not get involved with the process. For example, today I'm going to take you through some of the ways that I work when I mix, but don't concentrate on the process. I hope that translates to you. Um, the object is, when I said yesterday and the day before that analog sucks, I said it because in a certain sense it does, but that doesn't mean that when you use analog, what you end up with will suck. It just means that analog is not the wonderful format that everybody thinks it is. If you do your work analog or you do your work digital, the format is not going to change the result. And that's the important thing. I want you all to realize that don't sit there with your Pro Tools rig and your, your little console, be it the, uh, this device here, the Artist Series, or a D Command, or whatever it is, and say, if only I had an analog console with an analog tape machine, wouldn't this be wonderful? And I'm saying to you, no. It wouldn't change a thing. The music that you produce, whether it's in a digital format or an analog format, is going to be what your heart wants it to be. And that was the point that I'm trying to make. Don't go backward. Don't go back into the past thinking that that's going to help you. Let's move forward to the future. Let's now go in a new direction. And I promise you, if you go in the digital direction, you will not be unhappy for so many reasons, number, a number of which we're going to get involved with now. Not the least of which is, to get what we have here, what, what's this, uh, 30,000, 20,000, 15,000? And this, this is with a nice console and the whole deal. This would cost you 500,000 in the analog world. So what we're doing here is like 1% of what it would cost you to do the same thing in the analog world. And trust me, you couldn't do it. All right. So basically what I'm going to do today is take you through um, a step-by-step -step process of how I set up a mix, what are the important things to me when I mix, what is it that I'm looking for. Um, I have a, an artist here that came to me about uh, three or four months ago. Um, she asked me to mix this song for her. Uh, she's a very nice artist. Um, I listened to it. I said, this is great. So I started working on it. Some of the things that I do at home, uh, we're not going to do here because they involve some plugins and things that we don't have, but the concept is going to be the same. The first thing, uh, what I do when I, when I start working on a mix, um, and maybe we should do that. Can we save this? But basically, what I want to show you is the very first thing that I do when I mix is I put up all the faders. There is absolutely no point in starting to work on an instrument without getting an idea of what the song is like. And um, a, f a famous Frank Sinatra saying was that uh, 
um, you know, uh, no one goes, goes out of the record store whistling the drum part. Basically, the vocal is, unless it's an instrumental, of course, but the vocal is where the song lives or dies. So it's very important from my perspective that most of the emotion on a vocal track is going to come from the vocalist and the vocal performance. So the first thing that I look for is the vocal. So let's start here. Now, I have this, uh, just so you know, um, I have ex this is what I have chosen and I have the option of working on anything. I have chosen a D command and Pro Tools 10 as my mixing uh, uh, venue. That's what I use. The only difference between here and there is I have 24 faders on the D command. Um, and I'm running Pro Tools native instead of HDX10, but I just bought a HDX10 card, so hopefully I'll be running that. But in any event, this is what I mix on. And I, uh, I, have, um, I have three studios that I used to own, which I no longer am part of, but they all have consoles that I own. Any one of those could have gone to my mixing venue. Uh, one's an SSLJ, one's uh, a Neve 88R, not 88R, it's a Neve um, um, VX, and uh, VR or VX. And, uh, and the third one is uh, a, a uh, Euphonic System 5, uh, which I happen to love, but this does for me exactly what the System 5 does, especially now with Pro Tools 10, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The first thing I do when I set up a session is I group everything. I group everything to faders, to master faders. Why do I do that? Well, this console has a very interesting feature. If I group uh, all the drums over here, if I group all of the drum tracks, which are in blue, if I group those, let me just put this as small, okay, and small. Am I, oh, my groups are suspended, that's why. If I group all of these to one master VCA, I can then, on this console, select the master VCA, and I don't know if you, uh, oh, you didn't see that, all right. Um, you select that to the master VCA, and suddenly, here's my VCAs. I've got vocals, backgrounds, drums, bass, guitars, keys, and a master. Um, you may or may not be. Anyway, if I go to my drum VCA, and I select this, now all the tracks in front of me are now the drum tracks. So rather than having to move, like on an analog console, or move somewhere, to, 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 I can now have all those tracks in front of me to work on. So what do I do? When I start a session, I group them all to these VCAs. So I have the whole session now is here in front of me on seven or eight VCAs, depending on how many instruments there are. So I'm going to go now to user preview. I've set up a mode here just so we don't change things. All right, so now VM... Let's go, all right, so basically what I would do when I got this track in, the first thing I'd do is I'd start just listening to the track. That's the finished track, folks. I don't start out a mix that way. If I could start out a mix that way, I'd be doing a lot better than I am now. All right, so first I bring up the drums. And this is with no plugins or EQ or anything. So I just want to get a feel for the track. And then I bring the bass in. Now it's hard for me to hear here, so I'm probably setting up a terrible mix, but just trust me that this works, okay? I don't have speakers here.
Okay, so I'm going to listen. I just get a, it's not important how good a balance it is, just to give me a feel for the song. So I'm going to now listen to the song from beginning to end with no EQ, with no, uh, with no effects, no, you know, none of that stuff, just the basic track. I just want to know what this singer is doing. I want to know what message is going across. I want to get an idea, once again, of the emotion of the song before I start screwing it up. So that's the basic idea. I don't want to start imprinting my idea until I've heard the artist's idea. So I'll probably listen through it a couple of times. Now, again, this is a little, uh, it's not quite right because I've sent this through some additional effects that I already have. I'm going to take those off as well. So basically, Now, I also have an effects thing here that's going on, oh, so I'm going to bang. You wished I was there. Okay, no, I don't know if that's up there, but now it's winter time. In the wheel. All right, so this is my song without anything on it. I can still feel you go. So, I've now listened to it. And I realize the background vocals are nice, they're important. Do I want to spread them out? Do I want to sit them behind the vocalist? I start making kind of internal decisions. Do I want the drums spread out? Do I want them kind of sitting behind the singer? Same thing with the guitars, the keyboard. Is the guitar more important? Is that the focus of the track? Or is it the keyboard? Is there a piano that takes over? Um, the guitar player on this is uh, Steve Cropper, who's probably one of the greatest rock and roll guitar players of all time. So I know I'm going to want to focus Steve Cropper a little bit on some of this stuff. You remember sitting on the dock of the bay and songs like that, he was always the featured guitar player. All the uh, uh, Muscle Shoals stuff was Steve Cropper, uh, fantastic guitar player. So I'm going to probably start focusing in on Steve Cropper a little bit. Now the next thing is, so once I start deciding on that, I'm going to start adding my plugins to the session. Okay. It's very important to have other music coming in from other venues while you're mixing. It gives you a perspective of being in a cacophony of sound. So make sure that wherever you mix, you have someone putting the TV on in the next room or a radio or what have you. Let's start with a very interesting plug-in and, and why this one is near and dear to my heart. In uh, <clears throat> 1995, I had made a very conscious decision to start mixing digitally. Um, I had been mixing up to that point. I had been recording digitally, but mixing on an SSL um, uh, console or a Neve console uh, at my studios. And I noticed that I would go to mastering, and uh, in fact, I, I was having a conversation with a very uh, wonderful engineer named Alan Sides from America. And we were sitting there talking over lunch one afternoon, and I, and I made the point to Alan, I says, Alan, you know, I used to, when I finished mixing my records, I used to like to occasionally listen to them. Um, you know, like a month or two later, I'd put the record on the turntable and listen to it, and, uh, and I just enjoy listening to it. And, and, and uh, even, the, you know, and remembering the session and all that. And I said, but since the CD era, I haven't been doing that. And Alan said, you know, I'm feeling the same way. And at that time, we both decided that probably the reason was, was because we were mixing on analog tape, going through an analog console, taking all of this analog sound, giving it to a mastering engineer and saying, okay, convert this to digital. And, you know, I was talking about analog versus digital. Now, analog sounds nice on its own, but 
when you convert it to digital, it definitely changes it. There's no question about it. That's why I like to do the conversion way early in the process, not at the end of the process. But at the time, I was converting to digital at the end of the process because by then, vinyl discs were, were not selling as much and everybody was releasing on a 16-bit CD. So I've got to convert it to digital. So I said to myself, well, if I'm mixing on an analog console with half-inch tape, and then suddenly I find myself going to mastering and then it doesn't sound good to me anymore, that's probably because I'm converting to digital too late in the process. Digital is going to change what I'm doing. But what I want to do is, if digital is going to change the way this, this song sounds and the mix sounds, why don't I do the conversion earlier and then whatever digital does to make me have an issue, I'll change it. So I started converting to digital. Um, I said, let's, let's start mixing to digital from the console. So I started looking for a digital console. And I found a digital console in a Capricorn, a Neve Capricorn. From that point on, I started mixing all of my records. I'd record them. <clears throat> onto a 3348 digital multi-track, go MADI into the Neve Capricorn, mix digitally, and then go to mastering. And lo and behold, I didn't have to screw around at the mastering anymore because if the digital signal needed, if the vocal needed a little more warmth from the digital conversion, I added a little warmth. I could hear it now. I wasn't waiting till the very end of the process where I had no control over it. I was doing it as I was mixing. If it seemed a little dry, then I'd wet it up with a little more reverb. This is why, so I started doing all of my mixing digitally. This was in 1995. The next phase of my digital career was in 1997, I had an opportunity to work with James Taylor, and I did an album called Hourglass, and that album I recorded on a Yamaha O2R with three DA88s, all 16-bit, no analog anything, and it earned me my first two Grammys. It was an album called Hourglass. No analog anywhere in the chain other than the microphones. Everything went into an O2R using the O2R preamps, using uh, O2R every step of the way, except the final stage of mixing in which I used the Neve Capricorn, a digital console for mix. It was recorded at 44.1, not multi-sampled, 44-1, 16-bit, all the way down the line. But it, 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 it uh, gave me my first Grammy, and people started thinking in a different way after that point, saying, well, and uh, maybe the gear isn't that important, and that's what I'm trying to get to you. I had been working for 20 years or 15 years on analog consoles doing in the best studios in the world, and I got my first engineering Grammy on an album that I recorded in a house with an O2R and three DA88s. The equipment isn't the message. You don't need the best gear in the world to make a great record. All you need is some ears and, and, the, and an imagination. Okay, how are we doing here? Yeah. Are we ready to go? Yeah. Um, after I finished working on the Neve Capricorn, um, I was, it, was, it was running out of steam around 2000, the year 2000, because it wouldn't do multi-sampling. I couldn't do 96K. It was limited to 48K. So I started looking for a new console, and lo and behold, I found it in the Euphonic System 5. All digital, had a wonderful equalizer, uh, had an amazing operating system, and I fell in love with it immediately. So to replace the Neve Capricorn, I put in the Neve System 5. And for seven or eight years, I mixed exclusively on that. That console cost me $350,000. 
right here for $6.99 inside of Pro Tools 10, you have exactly what I had in the System 5. This is a System 5 equalizer, compressor, gate, expander, filter, uh, and uh, a few additional items like a phase button and, um, um, and, a, and, and a fader. And this is, so, uh, this is a Neve, I mean, this is a Euphonic System 5 channel, which you can now, as you can see, I can spread out over my entire session. So every single, every single uh, track in my session has the System 5 EQ, Expander, Gate, Compressor, uh, and Sundries that I use to mix about uh, seven or eight years of records on. That's all I used when I mixed those records. And now, I did add some effects like harmonizers and TC6000, but the actual sound of the track strictly came from my System 5 console. Now, for, let's see, what's $600 versus $350,000? Too much. It's, 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 it's a bargain is what it is, and, and so now you have the ability to put that across your entire mix for a ridiculously low price. Okay, and you don't have 13 feet of iron, which I had, which was this big, long console of 72 faders. So I now have that. I've got this great little console here to be mixing on, and now I'm going to sit there and I'm going to start working on these tracks.